Welcome to our webinar. Good afternoon to our West Coast families, good evening to the East Coast, and good day to our families joining us from around the world. My name is Karen Casella, and I'm the Associate Director for Parent and Family Engagement here at American University. It is really so great to see so many of you, of you here with us for this session tonight. We hope you're as excited as we are to have your students come join us on campus in just a few weeks. Now, before I turn things over to my colleagues, I have just a few housekeeping. First, you may view tonight's session with live captioning by using the link that we've shared in the chat box, just to the side. Number two, the session is being recorded. We will automatically send you a link to view it just as soon as it's available. Number three, we're going to answer questions at the end of tonight's session on screen, but you may of course submit them at any time throughout the question box, throughout the session, sorry, in the question box on your screen. Now, there are 350 of you on this session tonight and just three of us working behind the scenes to answer questions. So we may not get to every one of you this evening, and I apologize. If we don't get to address your specific question tonight, we'll share our email contacts for our panelists on the screen as the evening proceeds. And lastly, you are always welcomed to reach out to us at auparent at american.edu anytime. With that, families, I'm going to pop off screen and turn the session over to my colleagues for the presentation tonight. We're going to hear first from Misty Denham Barrett, our Associate Director for the First Year Experience in Housing and Residential Life. Good evening, everyone. We are very excited to get started and share some information with you. Um, just to give you a brief overview of some of the topics we're going to cover tonight, um, I'm going to start by speaking to you specifically about the community engagement and student support. And then we'll go into some specifics regarding health and safety, dining, move-in, um, COVID testing, and then, as Karen mentioned, wrap up with Q&A um, for the remaining part of our evening together. Um, these are a list of our panelists for the evening, and again, we'll share their contact information throughout the slides. There we go. My apologies. Um, okay, uh, so the first thing I'm gonna cover is residence life and community engagement. So this is something that I know a lot of families and students have been very eager to learn about what the experience is gonna be like for students joining us for the mid-semester residential experience. Our community engagement within the halls with students is gonna surround four basic areas of engagement. And those are academic support, equity and inclusion, safety, and holistic wellness of the students. So these will be the areas that we'll be focusing on when we interact with the students individually, as well as when we connect with them during our programming uh, and any support efforts that we might be engaging in to make sure that they're doing well, connecting to campus, um, and doing well in their classes and feeling safe and well in their environment. We have a number of support features available to our steps to the students. Um, first is our staff. Um, we have what's called a community director, and these are master's level full-time professional staff um, who will live in the building and be available to students um, to schedule meetings with. There'll be drop-in hours available for them to connect with students. The community directors will help assist with any concerns and making sure to connect your student to resources as they need and as they're navigating their transition to campus. Supervised by our community directors are our student staff or our resident assistant staff. And these are also undergraduate students, um, sophomores and above, who have been a part of the AU community for at least a year and are excited to connect with new students and help them connect to campus and to the AU community. They'll be hosting floor and community events, uh, that will help connect students, provide opportunities for them to socialize and get to know one each other, one another, uh, build connections with their um, the residents that may live on their floor or in their community, and also help connect them to, like I said, those resources, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, and then we have also our front desk staff or our desk receptionist staff. Our front desks are operated 24/7, and there's always a front desk receptionist there that's able to answer questions, direct students to appropriate resources, and ensure that students have answers to questions that they might need, um, whether that's how to pick up their mail 
or how to connect to uh, an office on campus, our front desk staff are very well trained and, and able to direct students um, in addition to the RAs and the community directors. We also have a new position on campus, which is part of the Student Health Center, um, which is our student health ambassadors. Uh, and they're working on campus to help reinforce and hold each other accountable within the community to address um, some of the uh, physical distancing that we're doing on campus, as well as health and safety regulations. So you'll see those students around on campus and supporting our health and safety regulations in addition to uh, the staff within residence life, um, the community directors, the resident assistants, and the front desk staff. Uh, one of the areas that I know many people have had questions about is how is my student going to connect with other students on campus? How are they going to build community and find their sense of belonging? That is really the tenant of our first year experience on campus. And one of the things that we are trying to be really intentional about providing experiences for students to do that while also maintaining the health and safety of our community. So we'll start with a number of move-in meetings and virtual socials over the first couple of weeks that students are here to help them connect and acclimate as they are transitioning to campus. Uh, and I'll go over more details about move-in later in the presentation. Um, and there'll be a number of floor and community events, both sponsored by Residence Life and Housing and also sponsored by other offices within Campus Life on campus. Um, in addition to virtual drop-in hours and lots of opportunities for students to connect with their RA and figure out what's going on on campus and, and ask questions about how to navigate DC and what it might be like to use the Metro, things of that nature. So students will have ample opportunities to connect to the staff and then connect to one another throughout their experience on campus. In addition to those things, there's a number of other things, details that I wanted to share with you regarding resources on campus. So in addition to the community engagement aspect of the residence life staff, our residence life staff is also here to support in the case of any emergencies or crisis that may happen during the day as well as after hours. So there will be information and avenues provided to the staff about how to access those resources and how to get connected should they need any type of emergency support. Um, one aspect that folks are also have to be aware of in regards to details of community engagement and access to the community is our guest policy. So only students who live in AU operated housing will be permitted to be guests within our residence halls during this mid-semester residential experience. Um, and that will be slightly different for move-in, which I'll go in during the move-in information. Um, in addition to residence life, there's also modified access to campus resources um, during this time. So campus, the shuttle, the fitness center, student center, the library, they all have services available on campuses to support students' academic and social success on campus. In addition to that, the student health center and the counseling center will have modified appointments and availability as well for students to connect to those resources if they need. Um, and then we will hopefully be able to provide physically distance opportunities as conditions allow um, throughout the remainder of the semester, depending on um, regulations and things like that, that we have to make sure to follow um, to make sure everyone stays safe. Um, so those are just a couple brief updates. And now I'm going to pass it over um, to my colleague Skylar from Housing to go over some details in this area. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, so I'm Skylar Osman. I'm uh, our associate director in the housing office, and I'm going to go over kind of two really key parts of this experience. Uh, a little bit um, about what the halls are actually going to be like, uh, going over some of the information um, about the lounges and, and what it's the processes and pieces about living in the hall, but then I'm also going to spend a good portion of the time talking about just some of the general health and safety elements that we've made to make sure are a part of the this experience. And we know there's lots of questions about many of these these things. So to start with some of the health and safety um, assignments have gone out. Uh, students know where they're going to live, and so one thing that folks will notice is that all of, all of the assignments were done on a single occupancy, and so um, that was an important key. Um, health and safety decision and, and something that we were very intentional about to make sure that everybody had their own bedroom and their own space to be in as a part of this experience allows, um, uh, yeah, really just have your, your own space within the hall, which is great. Um, there's also a lot of uh, questions about like the 
cleaning process and the things that we're doing inside the halls um, so that when students are outside their room, whether it's in their community areas or just coming to and from the, the building, um, folks are wanting to know kind of what we've implemented. We have a lot of signage in our in all the residence halls throughout from when you first get to the building, providing you instructions of um, and reminders about COVID-19 and the basic um, safety practices around wearing your mask, washing your hands, using hand sanitizer. We have hand sanitizer stations throughout um, uh, the building from the entry um, up through the elevator lobbies. Um, and then we're also working really closely with our housekeeping team and our facility management team to just really make sure that our daily cleaning schedules have been increased, that high touch areas um, are, are hit more often um, by our cleaning team. So areas like the lobbies, the doors, the elevators, those areas where there's a lot of traffic flow are gonna be cleaned more often. Um, and we've also worked um, to put additional reminders um, just throughout the building so that when folks know uh, when they're in certain rooms, the maximum capacity and things like that. Um, Missy already covered our guest policy. And so that's something that we're really wanting to emphasize to make sure that we keep everybody safe. So our students, once they're moved in, uh, again, just as a reminder, the guest policy is that um, it only guests in the, will be allowed in the building that are also living with us on campus, and that helps us um, keep it to a smaller population. Um, and, and that also helps with uh, all our students knowing uh, these kind of rules and the regulations that we put in place. Um, as folks are really, you know, familiar with now, we, we have, we do have a, a kind of mask or face covering uh, policy. And so we do need everybody to be wearing their, their face coverings throughout the building. So that's not just when we are leaving the building to go outside to go uh, do an activity, but it's also just as important when you're leaving your bedroom to do your laundry or go um, use a, a community bathroom down the hall. Any of those short trips, um, when, we, when you do step outside of that, uh, your room, we do ask that you always have that face covering on. And that's something we're, again, we're really emphasizing. We know it's a, it's a huge safety practice and we really want everyone to get in the habit of being able to do that. There's also a huge piece of community about this. And so we really identify with the AU community. We're all in this together. And so we do have some kind of community compliance pieces to this. We really want everybody to be looking out for each other. Um, and a lot of these safety pieces that are put in place, it's about protecting all of us and everyone. It's about protecting the person that lives uh, down the hall from you. It's about protecting our staff throughout the building. It's about protecting the larger AU community. And so we really hope that there's um, a big wave of a community effort that everybody uh, that's gonna be joining us here shortly, uh, when you move in, that you really, um, really become a part of this community and following these safety practices. We do, um, and there's a, we have a couple different pieces about specific about um, testing that David will get to later. Um, but we do want to make sure everyone knows that we do have isolation housing set aside and we do have a full process. Uh, David will touch a little bit on uh, the testing piece and what happens if a student does test positive. But we want you all to know and feel comforted that we this is something that we're very intentional about. We have a very uh, in-depth uh, process and procedure behind that many all of us on this call and a whole other team of colleagues all coordinate and work really closely together. So if we do have any students who test positive, we have set aside housing that's um, that's separate from the the residence halls right now that are going to be used for this mid semester housing, and we have a process to help those students get to that isolation housing and set up its own um, as its own set of process and, and procedures to make sure that that student uh, gets the care they need, the support they need, but also it helps keep the whole the whole AU community safe as well. Uh, and we have. Um, that process is set up to be very student-centered and very supportive. And so there'll be lots of check-ins throughout the way and making sure that that student um, gets the support they need. Um, so a little bit more um, about kind of what it's gonna be like to be able to once you're in the hall. Um, I mentioned that a lot of our communal spaces will have maximum capacity uh, kind of limitations that are a little bit different than we've seen in years past. And that's again, based on kind of the safety guidelines that we've worked with. Um, and so, spaces like our community kitchens, our community lounges, our study lounges, uh, those will stay open, but they just come again with an extra layer of restriction. So um, in, a, in a community lounge, um, the maximum capacity would say would be five. So no more than five students could be in there at a time to use that space. And that's set up 
uh, to really help with the physical distancing. We really analyzed each space and looked at the furniture. And so we do want to make sure you, everyone knows that those spaces are open and accessible, uh, but they do have some little restrictions. And that'll be gone over, and more of that information will be provided to students once they've moved in. And again, there's uh, an abundance of signage throughout our buildings that helps indicate how spaces can be used. Um, on that similar note, um, our laundry facilities are in all of our buildings on every floor, so they're super accessible. Um, laundry will remain open <laughs> and usable uh, throughout this time, of course. Uh, and the really only the restriction for it is, again, just based on space. We, while all the machines will be usable and multiple people can be doing laundry, laundry at the same time, we just ask that when you go step into that space to grab your laundry, to change your laundry, it's just what one person is in there at a time. And again, that you have your face covering on. Uh, a couple other little quick things to hit on. We do have um, a micro fridge rental program that's available. Um, we use this program every year and we have set it up uh, to be available for this mid semester um, opportunity. And so that link is on our website and it's um, we facilitate the process through a, a third party vendor. Uh, and so if anybody is interested in having a mini fridge uh, combo with a microwave or mini fridge and freezer section, uh, that is available for rental and it's a link off of our housing website. Um, and we encourage folks to do that. Uh, there's a priority deadline that's coming up, I believe, next week uh, that uh, if you submit your order, we'll have it delivered in your room prior to your arrival. And then um, we have a whole team of folks in housing, but also in facilities management that take uh, really good care of our buildings. Um, they've been working the last several weeks uh, and will continue to work for the next two weeks to make sure our faci facilities are all ready for folks to arrive and move into. We're doing um, lots of extra checks uh, in every room. Multiple people are, have kind of all their checklists to make sure the rooms are ready themselves. Um, but we do know that things still occasionally happen. Um, building issues do come up. And so we do have a process to submit work orders. And students will receive more specific information about this once they've moved in. Um, but there will be a process, and we refer to it as to fix, uh, where students are able to submit a work order to have anything taken care of in their room. So whether you know it's something as simple as the light went out um, to you know needing an adjustment with their furniture or something like that, um, there, there'll be a process that gets uh, outlined for them for that. Um, one just quick note. Um, thinking about furniture and back to the single occupancy rooms, we've gotten a lot of questions about the furniture in the room. So the rooms are all, um, the majority of our rooms are all traditionally set up for double occupancy. So there is two sets of furniture in those in the rooms. Um, and while for this this program, we're only um, having it each room be used as single occupancy, all of that furniture will remain in that room. Students are free to configure it however they'd like. They can move stuff around. They can push two beds together. Um, they can kind of maybe push a desk just a little bit out of the way uh, to make for more floor space. But we just need to make sure that all the furniture does stay in the room. And that's something um, that we do check um, prior to our arrival and departure. So lots of uh, good opportunity for creative use and shifting around of furniture. And I think now I'm handing it off to Anne Marie. Great. Well, thank you, Skylar. Hi, I'm Anne Marie Powell. I'm the director for dining and auxiliary services. I'm going to talk to you about our dining program during the mid semester, mid semester residential experience. But before I start that, I do want to make sure I tell everyone to make sure if you have not sent your photo in for your ID to please get your photo in to us as soon as possible. That ID card is also your room key. So you're gonna need that for move in and it will be available for you at the resident hall that you're checking in at. So get those photos in to us. If you've submitted the photos back in June, July last year, or you've already submitted them, unless you've received something back from us that said your photo was not acceptable, you had a hat on, and I know the parents don't want to let the students go and the parents were in the picture. We, can, we need the picture to be just of the student. OK, so now I'm going to talk to you about dining. What's going to happen during this mid, -mes mid semester? So on 3-4, when we start our move in, students will, our dining program will not be fully operational, but your meal plans will be already on your ID card along with your Eagle Box. 
that's going to give you the opportunity to use Eagle Bucks to order. Uh, we have a, a Grubhub on our list. You can order anywhere from within the DC area, almost any type of restaurant you can think of. And we also have a lot of local vendors around the campus, such as Starbucks, CVS, Whole Foods for groceries. So there are a variety of different places that you can utilize your Eagle Bucks to get you started. Remember also that Eagle Bucks is how you do your laundry. So make sure you save some money to do your laundry. The next thing is going to be from 3-4 to 3-6, though, we will be providing uh, in, um, box lunches, and there will be box sandwiches or box salads that are going to be sponsored by our Residential Housing Association, which is great, a group of students, and I'm sure you'll be meeting a lot of them when you move to campus, great group to work with. So they will be sponsoring your lunches for you while you're going to be moving in on 3-4, 3-5, and 3-6. Let's talk about 3-7. So 3-7 is the first official day that the meal plan begins, actually will begin. And it's going to be with one location open and it's gonna be our TDR to go. From 3-7 to 3-13 will be the only location that's open is TDR to go. We'll be offering a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we really are going to recommend that you uh, do it by mobile. So we will be telling you about a mobile app. When you check in in your packet, you'll get a little card that talks about how to use the mobile app, the things that you need to know about mobile ordering. And we're doing this so that we can make sure that we are safely distancing people. Now you can walk up to a cashier, but we really want to have your food ready for you. Order, go to the app, order your food, and then all you have to do is pick it up and you, there'll be space to eat within the Mary Grayton Center where the TDR to go will be. You'll just walk in, you'll look for the signs. We'll have directional signs leading to you to where we are. And we welcome you during that week just to try out the TDR to go to see what it has to offer. Starting on 314, which will be the beginning of all the other locations opening up. So what are those locations? Besides the TDR to go will remain. We'll also have Wonk Burger and a Surd Bird. What is that? Wonk Burger, you're a delicious hamburger. If you're not a hamburger person, we'll have Beyond Burgers. So we're, we'll meet your needs there. We'll also have um, Absurd Bird, which is chicken, fingers, uh, chicken salads, regular salads. Uh, you can get French fries. So it'll be a variety of things available there for you. And also every location will have either a water, a soda, some type of drink available to you. Well, we didn't want to just think, have you having burgers and a wide variety from TDR to go. We know pizza is a big favorite of a lot of people. So we have another location that will be on our East Campus. And it'll give you an idea to sort of explore the campus while you eat. So you'll walk across the street and go to East Campus and you'll be able to see, uh, we'll have a market there, a C store. That C store will be available offering a variety of grab and go items for your room, you'll be able to pick up if you need an aspirin or if you need a Band-Aid. Now, hopefully you won't need a Band-Aid, but hopefully an aspirin. But you'll be able to pick up different supplies there for your room and some grab-and-go sandwiches and snacks if you want to fill up your refrigerator so you don't have to worry. But the Bill location is located in the East Campus C store. There you can customize your own individual pizza. Again, all of our locations will offer mobile ordering. So you'll be able to order ahead, have it ready to be picked up. Um, the hours of operations, everybody wants to know, well, when do you start? So it, we will be posting the hours for every location. But just to give you an idea, our dining program will start at 8 in the morning and it will end at 8 at night. And that's seven days a week. I hope this will get, gave you a good start of what we're going to be offering for dining. And one last thing, if you have any special dietary needs, we do have a full-time registered dietitian on staff. She, you can set up appointments to meet with her. Uh, she will be able to walk you through and help you with your menu. Uh, where If we need to do some customizing for you, she will work those things out for you. If you should have some religious needs, whether, you're, um, whether it be for kosher meals or for um, halal or any other uh, religious needs, 
please make sure when you come in or send us an email, you can email mealplans at american.edu. And this way we can start to set that up for you so that we can start to work with you ahead of time. So the sooner you can get this information into us, the better it will be. You heard Skylar mention um, isolation housing. And yes, if you should unfortunately have to be in isolation housing, we will be providing meals for you there too. So I think that when you look at our program, we truly have you covered. Now I'll be handing it off to David. No, back to Misty, sorry. Back to me, hello. <laughs> um, so yes, back to me before we bounce to David for all of the hot topics, I'm sure. Um, first, we're gonna touch a little bit about move-in. Um, we know that this is sort of coming faster than we are all maybe ready for in two weeks. So we're really excited. Um, but we know that there's always questions and lots of details to still be shared. First, I just wanna remind everyone that um, there's information shared from the housing um, portal via email. Students are getting emails regarding updates for, from housing around move-in, things of that nature. Um, if you think that you might have missed an email or you haven't gotten that or your student hasn't gotten it, if you go to our website, american.edu slash housing and look at our mid-semester page, all of the emails that we've sent out to students are also stored there. So you can access that information at any time and reference anything that has been sent out. Um, we do have additional emails regarding more details that will be coming out tomorrow as well as next week. Um, so we're trying to really do our best to sparse out the sharing of information, not to overload students based on what they need at what time. So if you haven't gotten the answer to a question yet, just know you likely will get it within the next two weeks as you're preparing for your move in based on what you need at what time. Um, most students, you should have already been assigned and or picked your move-in date and time. Um, so you'll, if you're referencing Anne Marie's slide, um, some students may be moving in as early as the fourth, and other students may not be moving in until later on in that 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 time frame of the 14th. Um, we did our best to really make sure that we have set time slots each day um, to, to de-densify the amount of people that are coming into our halls at any one time to, again, to continue the health and safety of our halls and make sure that people have enough space and distance to safely move in with their, their two pre-registered guests. So this is the one exception to our guest policy is during students moving in. Um, you'll be allowed to have two people with you, family or friends, to help you uh, move into the halls. Um, and we will be asked that those two guests are pre-registered and information will be sent to you about how to pre-register those guests so that we're aware of that. And most of that is just for the safety of you and your guests regarding um, contact tracing or anything like that that might be need to be done to make sure that everybody stays safe and aware. Um, there will be a number of bins available at every hall for students to use to help move their stuff into their building as needed. Um, we will also be providing materials for those bins to be cleaned in between uses so that every, again, health and safety measures as best as we can to provide that experience for students. Um, we do ask that you are patient with us perhaps during that day. Um, if you're perhaps the last person moving in during that time block, bins may all be used at that time, but they will be finding their way back down to the lobbies for students to use. Um, and, and to continue to utilize. So we do ask for your patience with that um, as we're navigating the use of bins. They're a very popular commodity on move-in dates. Um, and then in addition to all of that, um, we will be providing, as Anne-Marie said, um, information that students may need at move-in. So they'll be getting a welcome kit with a number of things from both dining, residence hall association, um, housing and residence life, um, other things on campus that you might be connected to. Um, we're putting together a nice little welcome kits to help you feel connected, some um, giveaways, some nice items in there sponsored by RHA, things of that nature. So students will be able to pick those up as well when they're moving in um, and help them get acclimated. In addition to move in, um, for, as you're preparing for a move-in, we really encourage you to go to the website and check our packing list. If you haven't yet, uh, that list will provide you all the details about what to bring, what not to bring. Um, we know that that is often a hot debate as you're trying to figure out um, what to bring, what not to bring to campus, what's maybe not allowed to be brought to campus, things of that nature, all available on our website. 
Uh, and then the last thing that I'll mention too, um, which will be shared in more specific details from our community directors as you get closer to campus, is each day of move-in, there'll be a mini meeting and social at the end of every day to acclimate students to campus a little bit, share some details with them about how to connect to their resident assistant, um, go over a couple of the foundational things that they need to know as they get settled, um, and provide a social opportunity for them to connect to other students who are already on campus. Um, and then we'll have full community meetings at the end of move-in to go over in detail all the things that students need to know regarding being a community member at AU, um, policies and procedures to know, continuously reiterating our health and safety information, um, how to get connected, um, and how to access support. So all of that will be provided over the course of move-in, um, whether you move in on the, the 4th or the 14th. Um, okay, so now I'm going to pass it over to Dr. David Reitman. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to uh, be going over some of the burning questions that I know a lot of people have having to do with COVID and testing and safety. Um, <clears throat> before I uh, go too much into this, I just want to remind everybody that uh, all of the our, our safety plans and testing plans and uh, are designed to keep our community safe as a whole. Uh, these are not things that, you know, plans and policies and procedures that we arbitrarily came up with. All this was done in very, very close consultation with the DC Department of Health. Uh, we're following guidelines and best practices as uh, presented by the Department of Health, the Center for Disease Control, um, as well as looking at best practices in higher education and lessons learned over the course of the last semester for universities that did have students on campus. So um, with that, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, First of all, the pre-arrival testing requirements. So uh, I think everybody uh, who is signed up for the mid-semester residential experience got a email yesterday outlining what some of these uh, requirements are going to be. So just you know, in, in a nutshell, in order to move into the residence hall, students are going to have to have a COVID-19 PCR test done within 72 hours. Okay, of the of their move-in. So that means that um, if they live in DC, it's going to be 72 hours before moving. If they are coming from another state, it's going to be 72 hours before, before moving. But everyone has got their date that they're moving in. And um, we're going to have a chart that, that we're going to have uh, be sending out that's going to show if you are moving in on a Monday, you need to have your test on the, pre the prior Friday. And, um, and just kind of go from there. Uh, the expectation is, is that students, you know, should be, if they get their test done at, at that time, ha should be having their results by the time they are ready to move in. Um, if they do not have the results by the time they're ready to move in, um, there is going to be an alternative uh, place for them to stay until, um, that's not going to be in the residence hall until they can have, the, have their results uh, come to them. That may be just a couple of hours. That may be a full day, depending on what lab people are, uh, are using to get their, their lab tests. But this is something that is a requirement um, and there's not going to be uh, any wiggle room with this. We do need to know that everybody is um, as COVID free as possible before they actually check into the residence halls. Um, once students have uh, checked into the residence hall, uh, what's going to happen is that on day three to five of their uh, of their stay, uh, they are going to be able to they're going to test again, um, and the testing is going to be done at American University um, and you know in a in a testing site that we have set up. Uh, and and if they test negative at that point, then they will be able to uh, leave their. Um, it's, it's not really a quarantine. It's what call. It's what uh, Washington D.C. calls uh, limiting daily uh, activities. So, um, but there they, there there will be a requirement that they're going to have that they are going to be limiting their daily activities for the first few days that they are here. Now, students who are living on campus are going to be given a schedule of testing that they're going to be and they are going to be required to be tested twice a week. Okay, this testing is done. Um, uh, in a building, uh, Constitution Hall on East Campus. Um, students will be, uh, we, we, it's gonna be a saliva-based test, that so students will be expected to basically spit into a test tube with a funnel, um, and they're gonna do this twice a week, and uh, the lab that we're using will hopefully have a turnaround time of about 12 hours, because it's gonna be a local lab. That's what we're counting on uh, right now. Um, 
any student uh, who tests positive during the time that they're here is going to have to go into isolation housing. So we do have a residence hall that is just for students who have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, it, they, uh, if they are moving into that residence hall, they will not be allowed to be in their regular room uh, during that time. And the res and you know, once again, this will be a uh, isolation of uh, approximately 10 days. Uh, okay, from the time that they took their test, uh, and they will not be able to be around other students. They're going to be expected to stay in their room if they test positive. Um, they are going to have meals provided to them um, by dining. Uh, they will still be able to have internet access and attend classes virtually. So, uh, and they will have all types of different supports, if, you know, depending on what their needs are in this kind of environment. Now, we are hoping that we are hoping that no one's ever going to have to go into this into this isolation housing. Um, we are realistically expecting that um, that that there will be a, a number of students who will have to do this, and so. Um, we are going to have um, a, a staff member who's going to be solely um, uh, assigned to taking care of, of the isolation requirements of these students and getting them any kind of services, supports they may need. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions about um, COVID-19 vaccinations uh, over the last couple of weeks, and I just want to mention a few things about that. Uh, you know, right now we are following Washington, D.C.'s Department of Health guidelines on this. Um, students are going to be requ required to follow D.C. protocols. OK, so even if they come from a state that says that you don't have to do X, Y and Z uh, in, in, if you've been vaccinated uh, in Washington, D.C., we, we, we are following uh, the, the, the protocols for the D.C. Department of Health, which are very, very closely tied to the protocols that the CDC is recommending. Um, even if they've been vaccinated, they're going to have to do the quarantining if they, you know, as per DC's guidelines. Even if they are vaccinated, they're going to have to wear a mask. Okay, um, even, so so no, nothing is is going to change based on their vaccination status. I should also mention that um, a number of students may have gotten their first vaccine in their home state and are wondering, can they get their second vaccine in Washington D.C. Uh, just to, to explain the vaccine rollout in DC, it, 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 the answer is going to be most likely no. Um, in Washington DC, the, the Department of Health is administering uh, and really having a very strict guidelines on who can get a vaccine. So uh, unless somebody is over the age of 65 or has a pre-existing medical condition um, or has is involved in some other work that requires them to get the vaccine, uh, they, any student would not qualify. And, if, and, if, and so if you've gotten your first vaccine in another state, you probably will have to delay getting that second vaccine until you return home to that state. Um, unfortunately, DC does not have any kind of reciprocity with other states. Uh, most states do not have that kind of reciprocity when it comes to vaccine administration. So I'm gonna stop there, and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions, so I'll answer those at the end. Thank you. I think this is where I get to come back, right? I just got, I, let me recap this slide real quick and then. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, so just some really quick other information that really is specific um, to housing. Uh, and uh, we do have a really in-depth FAQ page. And so um, a number of the questions we've been answering, the talking points we've been using are all reiterated on our webpage. Um, so. Uh, it's on the link here, but if you go to the housing website, you can click to it directly off of our housing website. Um, and there, like I said, a number of FAQs that cover um, not just the housing questions, but all about the experience um, of what it's going to be like to live on quest uh, on campus. Uh, we are going to do um, a follow-up email um, to everybody that's going to live with us uh, for mid-semester housing tomorrow. Uh, so students should be on the lookout for a, a second email from us. Um, and we'll continue to outline um, the information that we'll be providing between, like, like Misty said, there'll be multiple pieces of communication between now and when you move in and then after when you move in. And we also already know, while this webinar is really specific to the mid-residential experience or mid-semester residential experience, we're already getting lots of questions about summer and housing for next year. We know there's some overlap in processes and timing um, and so here's some really just quick information but again this is all on our housing website um, important pieces to remember um, for returning room selection which is housing um, for fall for students who are, who are not you know first year students um, 
the next step uh, it is coming up quick. So we're in a, a little bit of a window. Um, but one important thing just to note is just remember it is a selection process, not an assignments process. So students do who are taking part in returning room selection do actually have to go in and select their housing. So they're picking that space themselves. Uh, so a little bit different than previous assignments uh, folks on this webinar may have heard about. Um, and then more information will be coming about summer as well. That was my really quick uh, kind of other information plug. Now I'll hand it back over. Here's some general contact information, but we can hand it back over to Karen. Okay, uh, so families, remember in high school when some of us of a certain age had to learn typing? I am so glad that I learned that typing because you all have kept us busy behind the scenes. Let's see what some of our top questions are that we can pitch to the group. Anne Marie, I want to start with you. There were some questions about how a student can confirm that they've sent in everything to you that they need to to get those ID cards. Okay. So they can just um, email us. Um, they can email us at uh, onecard at American at American.edu or if you want to send that question with, into the meal plans, we're answering them everywhere. So meal plans at American.edu, we will confirm and uh, be able to give them an answer back that we have everything. Excellent. Thanks, Anne Marie. Misty, question for you. If you can help folks to understand what, so there's a lot of questions about uh, like how many students can be in those lounges at a time, what the kitchen setup is really like, um, whether there's pots and pans, um, you know, what, what do we need to know about like the nuts and bolts of using this common space? Uh, Skylar and I can tag team this one for sure. Um, so most of our common lounge spaces have an occupancy of no more than five people based on how big they are. Um, for people to be able to be, you know, at least six feet apart, there's really not a um, logistical way for more than five people to be in most of our common area spaces. And that includes most of our kitchens as well. Um, so all of that signage is posted for students to access and so that they can kind of know um, so, but we have seen even students who are currently here for um, some housing that they're utilizing the lounge spaces and the small groups that they're starting to meet and um, they've done some physically distanced like movie nights with each other and so students are utilizing the lounges and following the guidelines wearing their masks and um, you know we've had students who watch the Super Bowl or watch the games that are happening and, and they're finding ways to, to be physically distant. Um, and maintain those occupancies. So that's the, uh, really our biggest thing. We want students to be able to use our lounges and engage with one another and connect, um, but we really just have to put the safety and health of the students first. So um, the, 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 the Mac, uh, Mac's occupancy will be enforced as well as making sure everyone's wearing masks and things of that nature in all of those spaces. Um, in terms of this kitchen, so there is no, um, like cooking supplies provided in any of our common kitchens. So definitely encourage folks to pick up some of those. Um, I know when I moved into college, I picked up just a bunch of like easy ones from Marshalls, ones that I wasn't really cared about if I burned in the stove, things like that. Um, so those are definitely some good things for folks to pick up, especially if you're planning to bake or do anything like that in the, um, the common area or, um, you know, additional late night snackage, stuff like that in the kitchens. Um, there's no pots and pans provided. Um, so we ask that folks bring that as they need. Um, but in terms of the actual appliances, I believe all of the common, the kitchens have like an, an oven. Skylar, can you confirm like what the actual appliances are available to students there? Yeah, so the uh, a, a really great resource on our website for all of our halls is our virtual tours. And so we know the number of folks haven't been able to get inside of our halls uh, to see them and experience it. So we do have a full um, variety of virtual tours for all of our buildings. So those are again listed off of our housing website. And so if you go there, uh, we do have the virtual tours for the common spaces as well. So it's not just the bedrooms. So um, we do, like Missy said, there is full kitchens in these buildings um, and there's full of, there's not, the one appliance that's not in there is a fridge um but all of the cooking appliances microwave stoves uh ovens things like that are there but you can check out the one specific to the building you're living in um, by taking a virtual tour um and it's pretty cool because you can just like click and drag and like look at all the different spaces um that we do have available um so that's honestly what i would refer folks to so you can see the one that's unique to your building those tour things are really cool i always forget that they we have the common lounges too in there they're very fun 
I dropped my college student off with a brand new frying pan and it came home at the end of the year unused. So uh, <laughs> as a parent, I would say stick with the microwavable meals and they will totally be fine. Um, David, there's a number of questions from students who have tested positive possibly mm -hmm. within the last 90 days. And so we're wondering, you know, what is it that they need to do? Because when they take a test, of course, they'll still show up positive. What kind of documentation and where should they send it? Okay, so if they um, can bring in uh, a copy, they, they can bring it with them, uh, or they can email it to shc at american.edu, either one of those, uh, or actually ideally do both. Um, just, you know, if just whatever kind of documentation that you may have gotten from your doctor or um, doctor's office where, or wherever you had the the uh, testing done, that will suffice. That doesn't have to be anything, you know, super fancy, but it does have to be somewhat official. It can't just be, you know, someone writes down on a piece of paper, I had COVID or something like that. It has to be something that's legit uh, from a doctor's office. Okay. Olive, got you. Can I also ask you to explain a little bit more? We've, we've not been requiring flu shots or, you know, vaccines before students come in the past. And now we are. Can you speak a little bit more to this and what that process looks like and what families should do if they've got concerns? Okay, so 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 this has actually been a been a topic that we've ha been discussing for actually the last couple of days because uh, it's been a little bit fluid. Um, we had a very very strong recommendation that students get flu shots. It is not something that we've been absolutely requiring. So, um, you know, we're, so if you you know, we think that it's a really good idea for living in a communal quarters. Um, if somebody gets the flu. Um, and 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 this breaks out. You're going to look exactly like you have COVID, and you're going to be having to quarantine. Um, so or, or and or isolate uh, for a period of time. So it's just it, I I would just really recommend that getting that flu vaccine is going to be really key. Um, but it's not something that we're going to require this year at this point. So great. And of course, if we've got students who are already in DC, uh, mm -hmm. they can get their COVID testing on campus. Right. And I think that information is in the email that they all should have received this week. Yes. Right. And if there's so other if, questions, they can email us. Right. So 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 if if you're in D.C. or if someone's coming into D.C., you know, earlier than than, you know, for whatever reason, um, it, there is online, uh, I'm, you know, on, and you can access this through the Student Health Center website. Uh, but there's testing uh, times every every weekday, so Monday through Friday, uh, where you can go in and have a one of those spit tests done, uh, like I was saying before. And um, turnaround time for that, you know, if you get it if you get it 72 hours ahead of time, you definitely should have that back by. I, just, I don't want to say definitely, but we expect that you should have it back by the time that's time that you move in. Excellent. Scott, I would also just remind oh. students to check the testing requirements um, because this is something that I had to do. I'm a coffee drinker and you can't drink coffee or do anything for an hour before you do your test. Um, so make sure that you're 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 timing that correctly and checking the website for all the the kind of the requirements for the saliva test. Yes. Right. That is an awesome pro tip. Thanks, Misty. Much appreciated. <laughs> Skylar, I'm coming back to you because there's a lot of folks who are asking questions about shipping, right? And I think we've got links in the frequently asked questions page for the mid semester experience. And I put that link in the chat box, but can you just walk us through again what families need to know about shipping items in the next couple of weeks? And I'm actually going to pass that to Misty to talk about. <laughs> she's she's got she's our guru on move in for this call, so I'm gonna let her address it. Um, yes, yeah, so definitely check out the FAQ. There's all the information there about mail and packaging, and we were we were able to confirm most of those details with that office this week. Um, so anything that is dated to arrive after the 22nd of February will be um, available on campus for students to pick up. Um, anything we ask that you please don't send anything earlier than that. Um, because it just sitting here won't really be helpful to you or anyone um, here in the mailroom. Um, and then, so there's also details on the website about when letter mail will be available, all of that. Um, the students will be getting their normal letter mail to their pack or to their mailbox in their residence hall. Um, packages will be different um, and will be picked up at a centralized location. 
Um, and th that may change a little bit in terms of where that location is, but right now due to the policies and the staffing on campus that will be at our 3201 office for mail services. Um, so students will receive an email once they're on campus, when they have a package, um, and they're welcome to sort of call and ask questions about um, uh, hours or, you know, I know we've had a couple students say that they, it's the large packages, things like that. So we really just encourage people not to send really big, large, heavy packages, at least for the first um, couple weeks until that centralized location gets um, a little bit more accessible to students on campus. I'm going to offer a pro mom tip here, which is that there's a relatively new target right in Tenley Town. Um, that is directly on top of our metro stop right there in Tenley and across the street from our free shuttle. So if it's something that's new, you know, like a comforter set or pillows, I would just recommend that you look at the ship to store option. So there's stu your student knows exactly when they can go and pick up their item and, and they can control the whole process because it can there's be really also a TJ Maxx yeah. and a Marshall's right down the street. There's a totally. there's a Macy's. There's all kinds of things like within a mile and a half of campus that are easily to accessibly be the walking or hopping on the shuttle. Super easy. Totally. And families, if you find that you're really anxious at some point in the semester about some precious item that you're trying to get to your student that you're not sure the best way to do so, feel free to email us at AU Parent and I'll give you the other options that are available um, that are sometimes a little bit easier to track than some of our campus deliveries. Anne Marie, there were some questions I'd gotten both tonight and in advance actually about the bookstore. Can you give us a status update and let folks kind of know what they might expect about accessing the bookstore? Sure, great news. We are gonna open our campus store. Haven't put that out there yet, sorry team. So, uh, But we're gonna be opening it two days a week. We're gonna start off with it being open on Mondays and Fridays. Um, we're still working out the hours, but students will be able to go there on Mondays and Fridays. Again, social distancing, so we'll have to track how many people are inside the uh, campus store at the time. And as we start to move on, move get into more of the mid-semester, we may add a third day, which will be like a Wednesday. But right now, we will we are going to be opening on Mondays and Fridays, and yeah. that will start the, the, the that will start the first week of the beginning of March. That's exciting news. Thanks for that update. I'm glad we asked it. And thank you parents for raising it. Um, so I think Skylar, this is going to go to you, but you may bounce it back to Misty. Questions about like specifically when the students arrive, and this is probably going to come in the emails, but if you can just help paint a picture for parents, what should they expect? Like they're driving in the car, where should they be driving to when they get on campus? Like, can they park? Do they need to check in with somebody? What do we think this is going to look like? I'm just going to take that one um, <laughs> from Skylar. Um, so we are still in the process of finalizing the specific details around directionality and things like that once students get to campus. Um, we're finalizing some of those details based on some construction on campus, some things of that nature. So that will all be included in the email that's going to go out to students on likely on the 25th, like where to go specifically, what, what what the direction is and all of that, um, and more details about the very specifics of day of things, um, that'll be coming out on the 25th in that email communication to students. So um, it'll be very clear and detailed for students. We'll have a nice diagram that we're working on. So it'll be super easy for people to follow and, and get to where they need to get to on campus. That's great. Um, Misty, I'm sorry, this follow-up is probably going to come back to you. But, okay. but we've got these, uh, so there's a lot of questions around what happens when their students have like just tested and they're coming to DC and like, so DC is not recognizing them now as visitors. They're going to consider them residents, but they're still supposed to limit their activity. So are they going to be allowed to leave the halls, to leave campus? Like if mom and dad have come with them to move in for the weekend, like can they drop their student off and then go out and sightsee and visit and come back what do we reasonably expect should happen that might be me and uh, dr reitman question but from my understanding um most of that behavior is just really kind of thinking back to when people were under um like quarantines early on in this where you were really only encouraged to go outside for essentials go to the store for groceries pick up medicine things like that that were really important so we're really asking people until they clear those initial testing stages to, to limit their behavior and stay in their residence hall 
Um, and that's why we're providing a number of opportunities for students to connect to their RA, to start to interact with people virtually so that once they are allowed to move about more freely, they've hopefully developed some connections and start, can start doing some of those things off campus and things of that nature. But yeah, we really don't encourage like a lot of, of movement once they've, they're waiting on their testing and things like that, because it just, it keeps everybody safe and until we make sure everybody on campus has been tested and goes through those regulations. But I don't know if Dr. Reitman has anything else to add. It's, that was perfect. I got nothing else to say. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Awesome. As a longtime resident of DC, I know I'm also monitoring, you know, what attractions and, and op opportunities are there even that are available and open? Like the National Zoo had to close again. A lot of the museums are shut. So it's, it's really very fluid altogether. Um, I think when the weather warms, the students will have a lot more opportunities to really take advantage of all that DC has to offer. But and I, as a an early, a little, a little early tidbit of information for folks, um, we are working to plan sort of a mini explore DC that will happen throughout the mid semester residential experience um, with the student engagement and service office. So it will be modified slightly, obviously, because we don't have the full AU community here for the normal experience. Um, but we will be providing some ways for students to connect and learn more about DC, the social issues that are impactful here, as well as like ways to connect to alumni that are working in the area. So more information will be shared with the students after they arrive because um, that'll be happening those programs will be happening um, a little bit into the program once they get here that's super helpful misty i think a lot of families have really been trying to envision what it could possibly look like if the one time we're saying physically distance but we're also like we know that our students are really excited to be here in dc so right and and like, what do we do to help them explore that safely? So I really appreciate that. I think it's very helpful. Um, David, I am gonna come back to you though. One of our trending questions this week, both live tonight and in advance is around vaccines. And what do we think AU will be doing? Where do we fit? Where do students fit into this picture locally? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, in in the short term, like I was mentioning before, there is a scarcity of vaccines compared to the number of people who want them. Um, we at American University, I, I, I do not anticipate that we're going to have access to vaccines to give students um, during uh, the month of March and April. Um, I am hopeful that we will have vaccines available to us by next fall. Um, but I think the entire country is, is in the same boat right now and, and looking for that. Uh, we do not know right now, is there going to be a requirement at any point for a COVID-19 vaccine? Um, just, that's just, there's too many variables right now uh, to even be going down that that path, although it is starting to be discussed. Uh, but for right now, I, you know, just being honest, I, we, you know, we do not have the vaccines. There's the chance of AU getting the vaccines to give to students uh, in the next two months is close to zero. As close as you can possibly get. And unfortunately, you know, and, if, and once again, if by some miracle we get them, we'll be happy to distribute them to your students, to our students. Understood. I know that I myself follow the district's uh, alerts for vaccines. I think I get an update almost every day, but every day they tell me that it's uh, priorities for those 65 and up and healthcare workers. So. Yep. Um, it's going to be a bit of a wait, I think. Um, and certainly we'll let students know as soon as it does become more readily, readily available, but it's not something we can really plan for right now. Um, and parents, I'm going to tell you, my own two teens go to the practice that Dr. Reitman is um, privileged at. So I take his word for these things. I trust my own teens to his practice. <laughs> <laughs> it's a DC thing. Uh, okay, so... I, I'm not sure who on the team might best be set to answer. This is probably going to be Misty, but we, I think given all the travel restrictions, we have a lot of families who are getting ready to send their student to DC on their own. And so what might those students expect when they show up to a residence hall without parents and helpers to help them move in? Like who should they see? Who's going to get them? Uh, so once they get to the actual residence hall for their check-in, they'll be um, front desk staff are at all of our access points for all of the buildings. So they're sort of our student staff that are our initial sort of front face for students. They'll welcome them, check them into the building, show them sort of where they're going, um, make sure they have access to cards if they do have stuff on there that they need access to that sort of thing. And then students will also um, almost immediately be able to connect to their RA that evening um, in terms of asking initial questions, getting connected to the hall, 
Um, you know, what are some things that are going to be available to them as they get settled? Um, there'll be a number of communications that are sent out from their RA, from me, from the community directors, from uh, lots of people. Uh, they'll probably at some point actually get sick of hearing from us and us checking in on them. Uh, we'll also be finding ways for them to connect to um, the Dean of Students Office, which is a huge advocate for our students on campus, especially those that um, are navigating certain situations on campus. Um, Dean of Students are really great at connecting and providing resources. Um, we know that this time is going to be also because students are, are in classes, right? And they're making this transition to campus, but um, a lot is going on. So there'll be a lots of opportunities for them to connect to students, connect to staff. Um, initially, most of that will, will be virtual. Um, just based on the nature of everyone getting settled and things of that nature, but there will be no shortage of availability of staff and within Housing and Residence Live, Student Health Center, Dean of Students, um, all of these folks will be readily and available for students that have questions or need to transition. Um, I've had students even just pop in and like ask me just a couple random questions about like just life um, on my open office hours that I've had. So our staff is available and here to really help them connect and, and feel grounded as best we can. Thanks, Misty. And I want to thank everybody on my panel tonight for all their help and advisement. And families, I want to thank you for all your questions. Since I've popped back on screen, I know you've sent in an awful lot more questions and I've not been able to catch up with all of them. But please do follow up with us. You can send them to me anytime at auparent at american.edu and I'll share them with this team. Your questions really help because frankly, folks, we have never opened housing during a pandemic either. So we're all figuring this out. What I can say is that we've had couple hundred students who've been in our emergency housing with us since January, and we're all working through it. We're figuring out what works and what we need to revisit. So thank you for trusting in us, and we certainly look forward to seeing you and your students in just a few weeks. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and end us on time. Thanks again, families, for joining us. We'll share the recording of tonight's session with you shortly. Good night. Good night.